They found Kenneth unattractive, unwitty, um, rather poisonous, and uh, he used to be, if you went to a party, there would, Kenneth would be standing in a corner and everybody would be surrounding Joe. And I think that's how it started. And of course, um, particularly in those days, Nigel, as you remember, uh, any new playwright was picked up. I mean, they wanted to find new playwrights. And because Joe was new, the newspapers and everybody spoiled him. And uh, I think it began to very slightly poison Joe too, because he began to enjoy these successful parties. And although he always laughed at them, I think it did have a slight effect on him. And certainly he was less at home, and, and Kenneth was more lonely. The night that, just prior to him murdering Joe, it was the first time that we had ever seen him on his own. We'd either seen Joe come to rehearsal, come to the play, or Joe with Kenneth. But this night he turned up on his own, and he sat in, at that time, there was a panto at the Criterion alongside Lute, and Simon and I had the same dressing room, and he sat in our dressing room on the sofa, and he was saying, I thought of the title Lute. I, he was justifying his existence in a very pathetic way. Because you and Simon were giving a hard time for being there. I mean, why did he No, feel not at all. We were, we were indulging him, but Sheila was very frightened by the state that he was in. They used to, they used to let us into their lives. They, Kenneth had once showed us a, a double page spread in a, in a colour supplement, which was all pills, all those plastic coated sort of like bombs, all in rows. And he showed us all the ones that he had. The last time I saw Ken, I saw him alone. I mean Ken because he'd been to the drugstore at the corner, because I'd got them on to national... Uh, they were both on national health, and I think they, they were suffering from withdrawal symptoms from hash or something that they'd had in... Um, I don't know where they'd been for a holiday. And I said, well, you must go to my doctor. And so he came here by himself, and the doorbell rang, and he came into... I lived downstairs then, and... He sat and talked to me, and I'd never been alone with Ken Hallowell ever before. And he talked in such a strange way. I don't know if you've ever met people who are mentally ill, but once you have, you can recognise it. And when he left, I rang Joe, because they used to use each other's voices on the telephone, and you never knew which you were talking to. They could... You mean they imitated each other? Yes, perfectly. How extraordinary, deliberately. Oh, yes, so you couldn't... I mean, never know. But I did know on this occasion that Ken couldn't be there. So I said to Joe, the party that Dorothy Dixon had arranged for him, which was one to meet all the older people, like Emily Williams and people like that, who were very interested in him, and he had agreed to go to that with me, I said, we'd better cancel that, because I think you must be with Ken, because I don't think he's at all well. Little knowing what would happen. That was shortly before about three days if that i think the day before almost i think it was a monday and the thing happened on tuesday i mean if you've ever tried to do an atheist funeral the best of possible luck and i must say joe would have laughed because when we arrived they asked us if we were the 230 or the 245 which was an absolute joe orton line it was a sort of um bijou crematorium and as the coffin came in to the crematorium, over these crackly speakers came John Lennon singing, I read the news today, oh boy. And the, the gramophone pin uh, went wrong and it went, oh, and it started to get, oh, God, it was awful. Well, Pinter and uh, Donald Pleasance, at his most sort of uh, bald, <laughs> gave these readings at... I can't remember what Pinter did, but, I, but it was something like, don't be moved, else you've missed the joke. It was something like that. And then at the end of the service, after this, this coffin had slid between these curtains, where it was supposed to be burnt or whatever, I mean, it was a sort of theatrical, phony front, we walked into these gardens at the end of the, the chapel, and there were television cameras on us all. It was difficult to look on it as real. 
but there were lots and lots of flowers and lots and lots of, of people. And it was the difference between uh, a Kenneth, who had no, nobody there, I think I was the only person there in the family, two aunts and a nephew and myself. But uh, This was Hallowell's funeral. This was Hallowell's funeral. Whereas Joe's was a very fashionable funeral, a great deal of floral tributes and things. The friends of Bingo have sent a wreath. Blooms are breathtaking. She looks a treat in her WVS uniform. Though I'd not care to spend eternity in it myself. She's minus her vital organs, isn't she? A necessary part of the process. Where are they? In the little casket in the hall. Such tranquility she has. Looks as though she might speak. God rest her poor soul. I shall miss her. Death can be very tragic for those who are left. Yeah. Her eyes are blue. Mum's eyes were brown. That's a bit silly, isn't it? I expect they ran out of materials. Oh, her eyes not her own, then? No. He's such an innocent, isn't he? Not familiar with the ways of the world. I thought they were her own. This surprises me. Not her own eyes. <coughs> um... That large heart we'll probably put on top of the motor. Um, on the coffin itself, we thought just a spray of heather from her homeland. It'll be a long time before I can believe that she's dead. She was such a, an active sort of person. You're going abroad, I hear. Yes. Where did you get the money? My life insurance matured. Tragic news about your premises. Was the damage extensive? Well, the repair bill will be steep. We're insured, of course. Was your chapel of rest defiled? No. Human remains weren't outraged? No. Oh, thank God for that. There are some things which deter even criminals. 